So my name is Naomi Scheich, and I am a primary care doctor at Harborview at the Pioneer Square Clinic. Um, so I see at the Pioneer Square Clinic, I see mostly homeless patients, uh, currently and formerly homeless patients. And um, I came to the area via New York, and I did my residency here and have worked here ever since. Um, so it's a pleasure to meet you all virtually. I'm sad that we can't do it in person. I've actually never been down to Valley Medical Center and would love to come sometime. So hopefully uh, in the future, I'll have a chance to meet you all in person. Um, so in terms of today's topic, my interest in this area started before, long before I went into medicine. I actually did a, uh, a graduate degree in social psychology so I learned some stuff that sort of helped me understand some of the basics about how humans think and behave in the social universe. But yes, I say a, lot of, no uh, a lot of what I've learned about um, implicit bias and related topics, I've actually learned after graduate school and just sort of through my own interest in reading. So I think this is an area where all of us really have the capability to develop um, some competency and some expertise. And it really doesn't take a special degree or special experiences. This is something that we can all really relate to as humans. So I'm going to do my very best to keep an eye on the Q&A and the chat. So please feel free to uh, jump in there and ask me questions as I go along. So here's my sort of roadmap for the talk. We're gonna start out with some pretty innocuous mental exercises to help highlight some of the uh, underpinnings of psychology that I think are really helpful to understand what implicit bias is. And with that, we'll then move into the definition of implicit bias. We'll talk about some of the studies demonstrating how implicit bias operates in the medical field. We'll talk about how implicit bias really limits our ability to see and understand our patients in their full and extensive complexity. And then finally, we'll talk about what to do about implicit bias. So before we jump into our mental exercises, I would like everyone to grab a pen and a piece of paper, which you're gonna use a couple of times during this talk. So hopefully that is readily available. So we'll jump into our first exercise. So I'm gonna show you a list of words in the next slide, and I'm gonna give you about 15 seconds to do your best to memorize this list of words. So don't write them down, just look at the list and try to commit them to memory. We'll come back to them uh, a few slides later. Okay, so just hold on to that and we're actually gonna move on to our next test. So this is the Stroop test. So what I want you guys to do is this. So I'm gonna show a bunch of words on the screen and I want you to look at that word and tell me the color of the letters. Um, so normally when I do this in person, I have everyone shout it out and it's really kind of fun, but I don't think we can do that in the webinar format. So bear with me and just say it out loud wherever you are, even if you're around other people, um, just, just go for it. So I'm going to start and just shout out those, uh, shout out those colors. Oh, okay, and my computer's giving me some problems here. So, okay, uh, it's running a little slow. So, um, I'm getting the circle of doom. Let's see here. 
Okay, so we're going to jump to the next slide, which is the next sort of round of the Stroop test. So for this slide, again, I'm going to have you say the color of the letters out loud. Don't read the word. Say the color of the letters that you see. Say it out loud wherever you are. And again, I apologize, my computer seems to be stalling and is not getting these words out quite as quickly as I would like. Okay, so hopefully what all of you noticed with this is that with that first Stroop test slide, the letters or the color of the letters and the words correlated, so green letters for the word green. And it was very easy to say the color out loud very quickly. For the second slide that's currently up right now, um, what we find when we do this in a large group of people in an auditorium is that it's slower for people to actually say the color of the letters when the word doesn't match. So why is that? That's because the visual cue of reading a word is sort of processed by our brains quicker than the color. So when we're asked to read a word, we can do that faster than we can interpret a color. We can still get to the right color, but it kind of takes us a little bit longer. So usually what we see is that first slide, green, blue, yellow, purple, and the second slide is like green, uh, blue, uh, uh, yeah, yellow, purple. Um, so, that is kind of the purpose of this test. And we'll come back to this and how this relates to implicit bias. So let's go on to our next exercise. So imagine that you are, this is gonna be a sort of visualization exercise. Imagine that you're sitting at this uh, traffic intersection in the red car in the top left of the slide. So I assume most of you drive and have been in a scenario just like this thousands and thousands of times. You have gone through an intersection like this so many times that when that light turns green, even if you're kind of yelling at your kids in the back seat and talking to your mother on the phone at the same time, as soon as that light turns green, you know exactly what to do and you can get through that intersection safely and going in the right direction over 99% of the time with minimal attention and focus on what you're doing. So now imagine that it is your first time driving in Nairobi, Kenya. So uh, that image on the top right is an intersection in Nairobi and the, the lower image is in Seattle. So what if this was your first time driving in Nairobi? If you were going through this intersection you could not get through this intersection safely and going in the right direction over 99% of the time while also talking to your kids in the back seat and trying to have a conversation with your mother on the phone. Getting through this intersection would take your full focus. You would be having to analyze, okay, where are all the, car the cars around me? Which direction are they moving in? How close are they? What speed are they going? How do I get around them to get where I'm trying to go? So this would take all of your focus. And while this intersection is definitely more chaotic than the one in Seattle, it's also true that if you learn to drive in Nairobi and you drove through this intersection every day, it might take a little bit more focus than that intersection in Seattle, but you still could go through this intersection without much focus because you've done it every single day. You understand the sort of norms that govern the way people move through traffic in Nairobi. So let's map this out. Let's make a sort of mental map of what's going on here. So this is what's happening. So when we're confronted with a stimulus, in this example, an intersection, what do we do? We utilize cognitive shortcuts that are built on all of our past experience in very similar situations. 
to allow us to understand that stimulus, to understand that intersection around us very, very quickly, instantly, really, and to act without actually even really thinking through what we're doing. What would this look like if we did not have the capability to utilize these cognitive shortcuts? Then our thought process would look a little bit more like this. We would be confronted with a stimulus. We would have to actively think through every single aspect of that stimulus in front of us. Where's the curb? Where are all the other cars? How fast are they moving in what direction in order to understand what's going on? And then we would similarly have to actively think through, okay, when the light turns green, I'm going to press my foot gently and then a little harder on the accelerator. I'm going to turn the wheel like this. And you can imagine that if we had to go through that process for every single decision and action we made in a day, we would be completely paralyzed. So this ability to build and to utilize cognitive shortcuts to understand the world around us and to act is vitally important to humans. It allows us to do the incredible number of things that we're able to do in a single day. So we're gonna go back to that list of words. So I'm gonna show you another list of words and I want you to write which words on the list that I show you were also on that original list. And I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds for this. So which words were on the original list? Write it down. Okay, so we're gonna move on and don't worry about it if you're not totally finished. So most people who do this exercise correctly identify that all of the words on that original list were words associated with bugs and insects and none of the words associated with plants or trees were on that original list. However, most people who do this exercise write down the word insect saying that that was on the original list even though it wasn't. So what happened here? So our brains are automatic association making machines. So even though the word insect wasn't actually on that original list, our brains in order to remember that list will insert things that seem similar or seem characteristic of that group as a memory, even if they weren't there to begin with. So all of these three cognitive habits that I showed you are what sort of underpin or give rise to implicit bias. So here is a, uh, an academic definition from one of the early papers. So this was the definition initially described by Dr. Banaji and Dr. Greenwald, and they are two social psychologists who did the initial work on implicit bias and sort of coined the term in the field of study uh, at the University of Washington. So this is a local field of study. This is my personal slightly less kind of academic definition. So what do we see? We see that we are repeatedly exposed to stereotypes throughout our lives. When we see newspapers, magazines, TV, movies, hear people talk, hear our parents talk, friends, teachers, look at books in the classroom when we're growing up. We're seeing stereotypes over and over and over and over and over. And that leads us to think that we understand a person in front of us instantly when we see them. It also leads us to make these sort of automatic associations between categories of people, someone that we see in front of us who we've now categorized and qualities that we're taught are sort of similar or associated with that person. And while we can overcome those initial snap impressions, it takes more cognitive energy. It takes us a little bit longer and we have to be actively trying to do it. So just like with that Stroop test, when you see the word yellow written in green letters, you can overcome your initial thought of, 
yellow when I tell you to tell me the color, but it takes a minute. You have to think, oh, no, no, don't say the word. Look at the color. Then you have to look at the color and then you say it. So it can be overcome, but it takes a little bit of, uh, of extra thought. So I like to use the analogy um, when it comes to stereotyping of sedimentation. So the process of stereotyping and the development of implicit bias is kind of like sedimentation. So if water running through a river is our thoughts, stereotypes are each grain of sand that pass through this water. And those grains of sand over time collect on, at the sort of base of the river and create the bedrock that shapes the movement of the water through the riverbed. So stereotypes kind of accumulate over time, build these implicit biases that give shape and give rise to our thoughts that go sort of rushing past this um, bedrock of implicit bias that has developed over a very long time. So how can we think about this in terms of patient care? So uh, what, what we see with implicit bias is that the stimulus can be thought of as the patient. Implicit bias is the specific sort of flavor or type of cognitive shortcut that we're using when that patient walks in the door to immediately categorize. Um, and then we go on to take our history and physical. So let's say we have this patient, Rita Porcine, who comes into our exam room. So as soon as she walks in the door, we, our brains instantly sort of recognize that they've seen someone who looks somewhat similar to this in the past and automatically associate these qualities with her. And so then we go on and we do our focused H and P. And of course our focused H and P looks a little bit different for everyone despite our best efforts. And with Rita, maybe we spend a little bit more time asking her about her psychiatric history or her sexual history based on our automatic associations. So how quickly do we actually judge somebody when they walk into our exam room? So this is something that's been studied actually pretty extensively in psychology. And I'm gonna kind of talk through a study that basically summarizes what have been the, the repeated findings in this. So this was a study that was done with around 250 undergraduates where participants were shown images of faces with neutral expressions for a small fraction of a second. And they were then asked to judge those people whose faces they were shown on attractiveness, likability, competence, trustworthiness, and aggressiveness. Now, attractiveness, we could say, is, a, is or could be a largely physical attribute that we could potentially judge based on a, just seeing a face for a fraction of a second. Likeability, maybe there's also a visual component there. But competence, trustworthiness, and aggressiveness, we really should not be able to judge based on just seeing a face with a neutral expression for a fraction of a second. So what the researchers found was that participants' judgments that were made in a tenth after uh, seeing the faces for a tenth of a second correlated very highly with the judgments that were made without time constraints. Those, so these judgments were not random. What happened when participants were given a longer period of time during which to see the face and to make the judgment, their, the judgments that they made didn't change, but their confidence in their judgments increased when they were given a little bit more time. So what we see here is that we make impressions of people instantaneously when we see them with minimal information. And when we're given greater access to people, that tends to only sort of confirm or lead us to become more confident in those judgments that we made instantly as soon as we saw them. So how do we actually measure and study implicit bias? So we do this through the implicit association test. I imagine many of you have heard about this and probably a lot of you have taken a test, but I imagine some have not. 
So this is the website where the implicit association test is widely available. And I would recommend that everybody write this down and explore this website a little bit later. So what the implicit association test does is it shows us faces associated with binary categories of people. For example, there's one test that shows us old uh, faces of older people and younger people and asks us to make associations with positive and negative attributes. And it has us do this sort of very quickly and test for how quickly we're able to associate positive versus negative attributes with one versus the other group of people. And in doing that sort of determines whether we have positive associations or negative associations with one of those categories of people. So another one of the tests uh, or a, another sort of set of tests similarly looks at binary categories of people in association with rather than just generally positive and negative attributes, inanimate objects versus weapons. Others look at gender and careers versus being homemakers and things like that, sort of binary categories. So there are lots of different tests available on this website, and I recommend that everybody take a couple of tests to learn about what some of their implicit biases might look like. And often what we find is that our implicit biases are in opposition to our explicitly held values. So let's talk about the impact of implicit bias in the medical field and how it affects our thinking in medicine. So it affects our thinking in sort of many different areas of what we do in our lives as physicians. So let's start with clinical decision making. So this is a study in which uh, physicians at several different medical centers were shown vignettes of patients presenting with chest pain that was somewhat but sort of vaguely concerning for an acute coronary syndrome. And they were randomized to whether that vignette was associated with a picture of a black person or a white person. So participants were asked uh, about explicit bias. They were asked, do you have a general preference for white or black patients? And do you perceive one versus the other as being more or less competent? So they were then administered implicit association tests on sort of general preference and perceived cooperativeness. So what the researchers found was very low explicit bias. So participants said, no, I do not have a preference and no, I do not perceive one versus the other as more cooperative. But they found on those implicit association tests a high degree of implicit bias with uh, less preference for Black patients and greater perceived cooperativeness among white patients. And what they found was that the greater the implicit bias that was negative towards Black patients, the less likely participants were to refer Black patients for thrombolysis. Same vignette, the only difference was whether it was associated with a picture of a black person or a white person. So explicit bias had no relationship to whether or not the, the physician said, I would refer this person for thrombolysis, but implicit bias did have a significant impact. So implicit bias, in addition to clinical decision-making, also affects our patterns of communication with patients. So this is a very nice study that was done in the context of actual clinic visits. And uh, so these were visits between white physicians and their patients. Um, and so participants were again asked kind of explicitly, do you have a preference for white versus black patients? And do you perceive one versus the other as more or less compliant? They were also administered implicit association tests. And after the clinic visits, patients were given a survey where, where they were asked a whole lot of questions about the visit and about their sort of perceptions of the doctor. So again, what researchers found in the study was no explicit bias. Uh -huh. 
participants said that they did not have a general preference and didn't perceive one versus the other as being more compliant. Um, but they did find a high degree of implicit bias and greater negative implicit bias towards black patients was associated with the physician being more verbally dominant during the visit. So I forgot to mention these visits were tape recorded and then the recordings were analyzed. So verbal dominance means that the physician spent a greater proportion of the visit talking rather than listening. So negative uh, implicit bias towards black patients was associated with the physician being more verbally dominant during the visit, utilizing more medical jargon with black patients. And on those surveys, uh, physicians that had a higher degree of implicit bias got lower ratings in terms of trust and confidence by the patients. So we know from other studies that when our patients do not have confidence in us and when they do not trust us, they are less likely to come back for follow-up and they are less likely to follow through with our recommendations. So if we are not aware of our implicit bias, what happens? We are likely to have that implicit bias nonetheless. And our black patients over time may without any sort of conscious effort be uh, less trusting and have less confidence in us than our white patients and therefore would be less likely to come in for follow-up and less likely to follow through with our treatment recommendations. And that would feed back in sort of subconsciously to our implicit bias that black patients are less compliant and less cooperative than white patients and would sort of reinforce that implicit bias without us ever recognizing that there is a component of our behavior that is influencing that pattern. So um, I am not gonna have time during this talk to really address these last two categories. But I do think it's important to mention that studies have shown that implicit bias impacts our sort of behaviors around teaching and the way that we evaluate our learners, as well as workforce and hiring practices. So let's sort of pause to do another exercise. So I would like you all to draw this grid on your piece of paper. And I would like you to write down in the first column, the names of eight people that you trust most. And these should be people that you know personally, not sort of famous people or celebrities. So I'm gonna give you guys uh, a, a few seconds to write down those eight names and to draw this grid. Okay, so for each column, I'm gonna uh, name an attribute and I want you to put check, check boxes next to the names of people with whom you share that attribute. So we're gonna start with gender. So in column one, put a check box next to the people who share your gender. For column two, we're gonna do age generally. So let's say within about 10 years. For column three, we're gonna do nationality. And if you are uh, multinational, pick whichever one or maybe two feel, feel like they're sort of the most salient in terms of your personal identity. For the next one, we're going to do racial group. And again, if you are biracial, uh, if there's one that's more salient, do that one. And if there are two, then do both. For the next column, we're going to do native language. And for the final one, we're going to do general socioeconomic group. So the purpose of this exercise is to highlight that we tend to trust people who are fairly similar to us. Most people when they do this exercise will be sort of, uh, will notice 
that they have a lot of check marks on the grid. And this is a normal part of human thinking. We trust people who are similar to us the most. And, uh, you know, going back to some of the communication and medical decision making, I think this, this plays out in so many ways, but it certainly plays out in our sort of trust and insight into just kind of believing and listening to our patients. We tend to believe and listen to our patients who are similar to us a little bit better than we do to those who are not. So implicit bias, I mentioned this in, in the early on in, in my roadmap for the talk, limits our ability to see our patients in their full complexity. So let's delve into this to understand what I mean by that. That's probably a little hazy. So let's start with this. When I first developed this talk, which granted was several years ago, I did a Google image search for drug user. And these were some of the first images that popped up. And I will say, these images really fit what I would consider the stereotypes that I have seen throughout my life about who is a drug user. So what we see are people that look pretty unhealthy, kind of emaciated, homeless, and certainly people of color and especially young black men, even though we know that black and white people actually use drugs at similar rates. So this is the sort of stereotype of drug user that I've seen over and over throughout my life growing up in the United States. And here's a, here's a case that uh, I think highlights how this sort of exposure to stereotype operates and leads us to simplify our patients. And this is a case that was described to me by one of my professors in medical school. So my professor was a primary care doctor and she, uh, she was working in New York City and she had a patient come in as a new patient who was a young and very successful lawyer in New York. So this woman walked into her exam room and my professor noticed that she sort of immediately kind of categorized her in these ways. These were the sort of um, kind of rapid impressions that she formulated of this person. So this person's chief complaint was that she had been having palpitations for a couple of months and she was concerned. She wanted to know what was going on. So the doctor asked her all sorts of questions about her family history, about stress in the workplace, financial stresses, um, and sent her for some blood work and an EKG and had her come back a month later. So the patient came back and everything was normal. There was nothing telling in her family history on the previous appointment. And uh, the patient actually offered at that second visit you know, doctor, I've actually recently picked up an old habit from college, uh, which is I've started to use cocaine again on occasion. And I've noticed in the last month that these palpitations tend to happen when I use cocaine. Do you think the two things are related? And ding, 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 it was the cocaine that was causing the palpitations. But what this professor noticed is that her image or her stereotype of a drug user and the sort of instant image that she had formulated of this person were incongruous with one another. And that led her to miss the diagnosis and to sort of limit her understanding of this person rather than sort of allowing her to be open to all the possibilities of who this person could be, including some attributes that may seem to contradict one another according to what we often see and are taught in the social universe. Now let's delve a little bit more into the complexity of race. I think that is a really, really important one as we learn more and more just how ingrained and insidious racism is uh, in our country and in the medical institution specifically. So this is a study that was done using data from a very large and long uh, um, long ongoing national phone survey where participants in the survey were asked a lot of questions about their demographics, including their race, age, uh, et cetera, lots of stuff about health related behaviors, exposures, and then lots of things about their health status, including would you describe your general health as excellent, very good, fair, or poor? 
So what they found was that people who uh, said that they were white reported being in excellent health at greater rates than black, Hispanic, and American Native, uh, American Indian and Alaska Native patients. So this is not surprising to anyone. This is kind of social determinants of health 101. So the researchers then asked participants, okay, so first we asked you what racial group you identify as belonging to. Now let's ask you, what racial group do other people identify you as belonging to? How do other people see you? And what they found was that the group who said, I am Hispanic and others see me as Hispanic, reported uh, being in excellent or very good health about 40% of the time. Whereas among people who said, I am Hispanic, but others identify me as white, uh, about 54% reported excellent or very good health. And these two were significantly different. And among the white, white group, close to 60% reported excellent or very good health. And there was no significant difference between the group of Hispanics who said that others saw them as white and the white, white group. The same trend was found for American Indians and Alaska Natives. So this kind of highlights the point that there's something different about the race that other people see us as and the race that we see that we identify as ourselves in relation to our health. Yet this is not the way that we tend to think about or kind of collect data about race in the medical and scientific universe. We sort of see it as this amorphous thing that we never really actually even define in our studies. Yet it is this thing that has many layers of complexity that we never really sort of think about, categorize, or identify in any meaningful way. So this is kind of a whole separate talk, but I do think it is important to touch on this. So about 80% of published medical research uses race as some sort of variable. And in fact, we are often required to stratify our results by race in order to get many different sources of funding, including NIH funding. And despite this requirement, we are almost never given any guidance on how to do this. What are the best practices? How do we do this well? What should race mean when we're using it as a variable? This is done in every field of medicine and allied health sciences. We never see race defined. Is it personally identified race or is it the race that others identify me as? Are we trying actually to get more at ethnicity and something about genetic homogeneity in a, in a particular population? Or are we actually trying to get something about social experience? We really never know. Race is used as a proxy for all kinds of other things, physiologic factors, genetic factors, environmental exposures, behaviors. And when we see differences in association with race, when we're using it as this type of a proxy, we, what we do is we obscure the true cause of unequal health outcomes by kind of having acculturated ourselves to see these unequal health outcomes in, in association with race, rather than using those associations to then ask the next question. Race is not a biological factor. So if we're seeing this difference, what explains that? What's our next study gonna look like? What do we need to look at? And it reinforces the subconscious assumption that racial difference is genetic. And when we're thinking about uh, single sort of identity categories, such as race, it's important to mention intersectionality. So intersectionality is the notion that any one category of a person's identity, for example, race, really can't be understood in its true significance to that person without looking at it in context of all their many other identities too. For example, a, 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 um, a very important example that often comes up is that of black women. So if you look at race alone or gender alone, you can't really understand what those things mean for that person without taking those two pieces of that person's identity in account together. The two things together mean something different than either of their parts alone. So let's go back to implicit bias. 
what do we do about implicit bias? Hopefully I've convinced you that implicit bias is out there and it affects the way that we think, communicate and behave in medicine. So unfortunately, no one's really been able to find a way to get rid of our implicit biases. These are cognitive habits that develop over a lifetime of exposure to stereotypes. So it's very, very difficult to undo them and no one's been able to show a way to do that. What we can do is we can intervene between our snap impressions of people and our actions in order to stop our implicit biases from leading us to behave differently towards people. So here are some sort of evidence-based strategies to avoid the negative downstream effects of implicit bias. So first of all, the two absolutely key ingredients in trying to combat the negative effects of implicit bias are awareness and concern. If we are not aware of our implicit biases, or if we don't think of them as problematic, we are just not going to be motivated to do anything about them. So this is a study that showed that by increasing our sort of awareness of our susceptibility to bias, we actually do better in terms of making more egalitarian decisions. So this, in the study that I showed you about uh, refer about the patient presenting with chest pain and physicians being asked whether or not they would refer for thrombolysis, a subset of participants in that study were made aware that what the researchers were studying was implicit bias and whether that affects clinical decision making. That subset did significantly better in terms of making egalitarian recommendations about whether or not to refer the patient for thrombolysis. So some people might say that, you know, that was in the context of a study and participants didn't want to get caught making sort of racially biased clinical decisions. So that doesn't really translate to the real world. But I would make the argument that most of us get up in the morning wanting to and being motivated to treat our patients well and not to make racially biased medical decisions. And so if we are aware that we are susceptible to doing that and want not to do that, whether it's because we think someone's studying us or just because we're concerned about treating our patients well, uh, the, the sort of the behavior follows. So I would make the argument that what was found in that study is totally relevant to us just working in the clinical world and not in the context of this research study. So uh, the next strategy is focusing on objective information. So this was a study where physicians were given uh, some type of information and they were randomized about uh, patients with uh, symptoms suspicious of COPD. So they were randomized to whether they received actual PFT data versus whether they received uh, information about symptoms and demographics alone. Not surprisingly, the physicians who were given the objective data, the, the PFT numbers, um, made less racially biased uh, decisions about the diagnosis. Taking the perspective of the other. So this is a study where nurses were given uh, vignettes about a, pa a, a patient presenting with pain and they were asked to make recommendations for treatment with medications. And they were randomized to whether they were just told make recommendations for treatment versus whether they were told take a moment to consider the patient's experience of his or her pain. And moment was not specified. It could be kind of any period of time and any degree of effort. And it turned out that the, the participants who were asked to take that moment to consider the perspective and experience of the patient made less racially biased treatment recommendations. So this is something that we can all do quickly in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, diversifying the workforce also works in making all of us less racially biased in our medical decision-making and in our behavior. I think it's important to mention for all of us who are uh, busy and tired much of the time that fatigue and lack of time leads to more biased behavior. 
And if we think back to those exercises we did early on in the talk to the, um, the exercise we did with the uh, visualization of being in the car, you know, we can sort of think about how when we have to act very, very quickly, when we don't have the time or energy to think through what we're doing, or when that light quickly turns green, we rely on that automatic thinking kind of more readily. We don't have the sort of time and energy and luxury to actively think through what we're doing. So the same is true when we're dealing with implicit bias. So that's something that we all need to be aware of and that we need to think about um, in order to motor, motivate ourselves to stop and take a moment and think about whether we're really doing what we think is right by the patient when we're busy and tired. So for those of us who are educators, which is pretty much all of us in some capacity or another, it's really important for us to recognize that the behavior that we model towards patients is associated with those learners who are watching us developing stronger biases. So this was studied, um, this has been studied both in medicine and not. So the study that was done in the context of med medical education was done at about 50 medical schools among thousands of medical students, where students were administered implicit association tests early on and at the end of medical school, and they were given regular surveys about things they saw and experienced in the context of medical school. And uh, hearing a lot of negative comments from attendings and residents about African-American patients was a significant predictor of students developing increased implicit bias that was negative towards black patients over the course of medical school. So the good news is that not specifically from this study, but in other studies in psychology, the reverse is true too. When we model non-biased behaviors, those around us become less biased. So I think it's also important to think about what we can do outside of just sort of the medical universe and our lives at work, because implicit bias, even though we're learning about it right now at Grand Rounds in the context of your workday, implicit bias is not about being a physician. Implicit bias is about being a human being out in the world, and it's something that we all experience. So I like to recommend that everyone practice bias mindfulness. So what I, uh, what I mean by this is to pick a buddy, and that can be a family member, it can be a friend, it can be a colleague, it does not and, uh, and certainly does not need to be someone that you work with. And that person is going to be your bias buddy. And pick a regular time to have a conversation with that person, whether it's every other week or once a month, where you discuss things that you've noticed in your own thinking and your own behavior that may reflect implicit bias. And when you start to do this practice with another person, what's gonna happen? So one is you're gonna develop a little bit more comfort talking about this stuff, which is hard and it's really important for us to, uh, to learn to do this. And you're also gonna start to recognize, you'll be looking for it. So you'll start to recognize these patterns of thinking and behavior in yourself. And that will give you the opportunity to either stop yourself before you say or do something that's not quite right that popped into your head. And it's also gonna give you the opportunity to sort of take a step back and maybe apologize or recognize or shed light on the fact that you did something or you said something that probably was a reflection of bias and that wasn't quite right. And so normally if we were in person, I would, uh, I would break you guys up into small groups and we would actually start this, this practice today. But because we're in a Zoom webinar, we don't really have the opportunity to do that. So I would encourage you all to take a moment after this talk to think about someone that you could start doing this practice with on a regular basis. So uh, this is my requisite joke slide coming up. Here we go. Okay. Um, so obviously this slide is a joke, but you know, the reason that I start with those psychological exercises is that I hope what I've demonstrated to you all today is that implicit bias isn't about whether you are a good person or a bad person. 
we have these cognitive habits, these cognitive shortcuts as, you know, as human beings and our ability to use those cognitive shortcuts is extremely beneficial to us in most situations. It's, it's what allows us to function in the extremely complex world that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis and to do the incredible number of things that we do in a day. Implicit bias is one unfortunate downside of that cognitive wiring. It's fundamental to all humans. We are all biased. We all think this way. So I think we really need to get away from a conversation with ourselves or with others about whether or not, you know, we're, we're racist or we're bad people or good people and just recognize that this is how our brains are hardwired to think, accept it and work together to figure out what we can do about it. So this is a quote from uh, civil rights anti-lynching activist Ida B. Wells. The way to right the wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. So once we start to recognize and understand what implicit bias is and what our own biases look like, that's when we can really start to do something about it. So I'm just gonna sort of click through my take home points here. And please go ahead and put any questions into, I think our two options are the chat box and a Q&A, but through any mechanism available, please feel free to ask any questions. This is Elin. Can you guys hear me? Hi. Hello. Thank you so much, Naomi, for that enlightening and absolutely fabulous talk. Um, with our remaining few minutes, we did want to open up the floor to any questions, um, just like uh, Naomi said. And so you guys can either ask questions through the Q&A option or through the chat box. We'll give it a few minutes. And if no questions come through, we can just end the session early. So it looks like we have one question. Um, the question is, how do cognitive shortcuts of implicit bias form? Um, so, you know, that goes back to my early slides and some of those, those um, cognitive tests that we did. What happens is when we're exposed to stereotypes over a lifetime, our brains pick up on those stereotypes and build them into those, into sort of automatic associations that we make, again, subconsciously when we encounter someone, uh, a person in front of us. Um, and if you would like to read more about that, I would recommend the book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by, let's see if I have it here. Um, yes, I do. By Daniel Kahneman. Uh, yeah, but just by Daniel Kahneman. Um, and the guy who wrote Moneyball, whose name I'm blanking on, also wrote a book about Daniel Kahneman and his, um, his sort of partner in psychological research, Amos Tversky, who developed so much of the research that has led us to now understand uh, cognitive biases in general. Um, and I will also say, I usually put up a slide with my email and I, uh, I missed it on this one, but I'll let you know my email is just my last name, S-H-I-K-E at uw.edu. So if any of you guys have questions or would like reading recommendations or uh, want to discuss anything, please feel free to get in touch anytime. Um, so someone wanted to go back to the... Uh, the slide where I showed the implicit association test website. So let's do that. Um, here we go. So, so I will also say if you just Google implicit association test Harvard, it'll get you to the right place because the researcher who, who um, kind of keeps track of the results from this website is, uh, is part of the Harvard psychology department. Well, if there are no more questions, I think we'll go ahead and conclude the session. Once again, thank you so much, Naomi, for giving this talk. This was absolutely fabulous. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your week.